right, so we're here with Tiffany Inc. from California Environmental Justice Alliance, CEHA, and she's going to be talking briefly about SB 1000. Um, so take it away, Tiffany. Sure. Um, again, so yeah, I'm Tiffany. I'm the Green Zilch Program Manager at CEHA, or the California Environmental Justice Alliance. We are a statewide alliance of 10 different organizations um, throughout California, from Oakland and San Francisco, down to the Central Valley and to LA and the San Diego region. Um, CEHA was one of the co-sponsors of the SB 1000 law, along with the uh, Center for Community Action and Environmental Justice based in the Inland Valley. And our main goal is to basically encourage more jurisdictions, um, cities and counties, to include environmental justice when they do their planning efforts, because we know that environmental justice is crucial to um, doing good land use planning. Great, so. thank, you. thank you. And so, can you give us a quick overview of what SB 1000 entails? Right. So SB 1000 is a law that was passed in 2016. And basically what it says is that if your city or county um, has what's called a disadvantaged community, which I can talk about more, that means that you have to include environmental justice goals, policies, and objectives into the elements of your general plan or create a whole standalone environmental justice element in your general plan. And so general plans are basically like a guiding document for a city or county. It projects what kind of growth or development that you want to have and like the big positive vision of your, of your area. So if you want to have more housing or better transportation or cleaner air or more economic development, general plans can help guide those ideas um, in a very broad sense. So uh, general, general plans are made up of seven elements, seven basic elements in California. Um, those include things like housing, um, circulation, which is basically like transportation, land use, which is like where things in cities and counties are situated next to each other. Like, do you want to put homes next to schools? Do you want to put them next to a factory? Do you want to put them next to, you know, businesses? Land use tells you where you can put different parts of your city. Um, you know, there's other elements like noise and safety and open space. Open space is basically like parks or like green space. So this law basically says you have to include environmental justice elements, like a standalone element, or integrate environmental justice goals and policies throughout those different elements that I just mentioned. So um, there's some basic things about S1000, right? You want to make sure that you reduce air pollution and just pollution in general in your community and reduce basically what's called disproportionate health impacts, like basically in which some community members are more negatively impacted than others by environmental pollution. So you want to reduce that. Um, you want to also promote community engagement in these decision-making processes. So when people decide in cities where uh, things are situated in a city, like for land use, for example, or transportation improvements, um, community members and residents should be involved in those planning processes in certain, in certain ways. Um, the last thing that the law calls for is a way to increase improvements and in programs that address the needs of disadvantaged community members. So whatever people need, um, you know, people should plan for in cities and counties. And so the one thing that people always have a question about is what does it mean to be a disadvantaged community? And there's different things within California law that can kind of talk about what it means to be a disadvantaged community. Um, the California uses this tool called Cal Envirus Screen, which is basically a comprehensive cumulative impacts tool that takes 20 different, ideas, 20 different issues, for example, um, ozone, um, particulate matter, um, hazardous waste facilities, water quality problems, and combines it with socioeconomic and health issues like cardiovascular disease and asthma and poverty and unemployment to see where are the greatest combined burdens in a community. So if a community has a ton of burdens, that shows that those are some of the most polluted and also neglected areas of the state that need to be addressed and improved. So that mapping tool kind of shows where disadvantaged communities can be located, but it's really up to states and counties to really define disadvantaged communities. Like you could say, um, you know, if you rank all the census tracts in California and you could, you could take the top 25% of the most burdened communities using that tool, you could take top 30%. You could even say like, for example, for the Central Valley, um, we wanna take all Stanislaus County or San Joaquin County census tracts and say the top 30% or the top 10% are the most burdened or disadvantaged communities. So um, it's really about 
finding ways to say which areas need the most investment improvements and are most burdened by pollution. Um, and this is not only like a technical thing, this is something that can be done with community members because residents know what's happening on the ground and they can say, these are problems that we're experiencing and we want to say, you know, th these are things that should be addressed in this planning process. So it's a combination of using different forms of expertise, like, you know, uh, city planners and local government and residents and and community-based organizations and um you know academics yeah. to find out what are the best and most pressing issues that should be addressed in these processes great no that's that's exactly true i mean i think that you're right when you say residents are the ones that are you know there and they're living there in these communities and they know what's affecting them so i think that's great to point that out why do you feel, I mean, you just gave so many different reasons why it is important, but mm -hmm. if you had to just choose one reason for why it's important, what would it mm -hmm. be, just one? I know that's difficult. Yeah, but. well, I think the biggest thing is that we want to have justice. We want to have cleaner, healthier communities for everybody. And we know that certain people, especially people of color, immigrants, um, indigenous people, like people have never really gotten the benefits that they deserve mm -hmm. when it comes to like investments and better protections. So let's start with the people most impacted by these problems and give them the more resources yeah. and more planning. So more of a, yeah, like equity, right? Bottom right. line equity. Yeah. 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 And we all, we all deserve to live in a healthy environment. Like why should we create situations where people are being negatively impacted? Like health is so important. You know? Exactly. No, that's very true. Um, how does it connect to the overall environmental justice? I mean, that, you know, you hear it everywhere. You hear environmental justice. How would you say this directly, you know, connects to environmental justice? Because I mm -hmm. feel like it's so broad, right? I mean, environmental justice. But yeah. how, how does SB 1000, besides, you know, identifying these communities, how mm -hmm. would you say on a bigger perspective? Right. Well, one thing to note is that the environmental justice movement came out of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So it takes that like racial justice and class just or like, you know, income justice lens and says, you know, not only do we have these things in employment and like other issues, you know, just like, you know, segregation, we have this when it comes to environmental protections and laws. Like there's things that segregate people and keep them, you know, underrepresented in, in politics and also um, have a lack of resources. So I think the biggest thing is realizing that, um, you know, for a long time, people's voices weren't really being heard and they had to ask to be heard. And this law is really great because for the first time, we actually have environmental justice in a planning law, which isn't really like something that people thought could actually really happen. Mm -hmm. So for people working on this for a long time, they're like, wow, this is really amazing. Like it doesn't do everything because obviously like there's a lot of work to be done, especially from community members. But um, it's a really great start to really push for things that we need in our cities and counties. Yeah. And could you give a little background about how it came about, the SB 1000? I know that you mentioned sure. it earlier, mm -hmm. but just, just so people can understand where that idea came of incorporating that into general plans. Right. Well, um, so it has made of, uh, you know, 10 different organizations. So two of them actually have environmental justice elements in their general plans, and they fought for that. So the first actual city to have an EJ element was in National City. And the group that we work with there is the Environmental Health Coalition. And they're made up of like a lot of different residents from that area who suffer from like really bad land use problems and lack of um, transit and other jobs. So. They were like, well, if you're going to do a health element in the general plan, why don't you do a health and environmental justice element? So we're not just talking about just general health issues, but also environmental justice issues. So through their advocacy, they actually pushed the city to do that element and incorporate better goals into their plan. Um, and that was, in, I believe, in 2012. And in 2014, um, the new city of Fruitva Valley was created, and they created a general plan. And they actually started to violate the general plan by doing things that were actually harming public health through pollution. Um, so the Center for Community Action and Environmental Justice, which is a part of SEHA, they said, wait a minute, this is going against the general plan. You can't do this. And they actually invited the Attorney General of California to get involved to create a lawsuit against the city of Tropa Valley. And as a part of that settlement, they said, you have to create an EJ element to the general plan to make sure that you're protecting, you know, you're promoting environmental justice and protecting human health. So um, 
through that process, you know, CCAJ was able to work with residents, conduct a ton of community meetings and um, processes to get resident input into that environmental justice element for Hoover Valley. So, so we thought mm -hmm. these are working on the grounds in Hoover Valley and National City. Why can't we have this in more cities across the state? Yeah. This is a good practice. So it was really a grassroots effort, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, That's great. definitely. Definitely. Okay, great. And how do you feel about it affect, you know, directly affecting these communities? Um, what has been some of the results that you've seen with these first communities that first implemented? Um, what has been the successes and the, you know, the right. challenges as well? Right. I think the biggest successes that people have talked about from EHC and CCAJ is that residents are definitely more empowered to like have a voice in these kinds of important planning decisions. So you can't just like sweep people under the rug and be like, this cannot involve you. Like people need to be heard and have their issues raised up. So um, I think that's been a really meaningful part of this whole EJ planning process. Um, there have been some like benefits where residents have been able to get certain kinds of policies into general plans like we want to have buffer zones between uh, polluting trucks and homes, we want to have um, you know, stronger land use changes so that um, old polluting uses are grandfathered out over time, which means they have to leave if, they're, if they don't conform to the land use policies at the, on the ground. Um, the other thing is that because general plans must be consistent or like completely compatible, with other plans like community plans or area specific plans, it allows you to have more tools. So like in, in National City, there's something called the, um, the Old Town National City Plan, which actually has some strong policies and improvements for creating like, you know, um, better land use and like more affordable housing. And so because of the, of the general plan and the Southwest Pacific, I'm oh, sorry, the, uh, the Old Town National City Plan, they were able to really push for um, improvements. And then when um, polluting uh, land uses want to come into that area, they're like, no, that goes against the plan. We can't do that. So it gives communities some leverage and some tools to help push against um, the bad things coming into their neighborhoods and also promote and ask for the good things they want to see in their neighborhoods. No, that's true. And as far as like updates on the process, um, I know that you said that they've gotten involved and whatnot. What are some of like the good positive things that have came out of that um, that you've seen? Mm -hmm. I think um, the biggest thing is that it really gives more attention to these issues that don't get talked about. Um, so sometimes I think communities feel like they get steamrolled over and like their voices aren't heard. So they've been able to, um, you know, get more protections. I think the biggest challenge with the law is that general plans are meant to be enforced by the public. So this is not something where the state actually goes in and says, you're not doing your job. It has to be residents and community members and advocates who are saying, you're not doing your job. Mm -hmm. We're going to make you take action. So that's a good thing because it empowers people, but it's a challenging thing because sometimes you need more resources to push against the city, right? Like legal action. Yeah. So um, where there's those opportunities to push against the city, that's been great. When there's less resources to push against the city or county, it's been challenging, um, to be honest. So I think it's really like, that's one thing that we want to continue to work on to make sure that there's more safeguards for communities because the general plan is a good guidance document, but it doesn't do everything. And so it's really on us to like hold local governments accountable for doing the right thing. Um, but in terms of good things, I mean, there have been things like, you know, again, like the buffer zones policy, there's been like restricted truck routes so like you can't have truck routes going through certain neighborhoods. Um, there's been like goals to have more air um, filters and homes that located next to, you know, freeways. So there's definitely things where people can ask for specific improvements. Um, in National City, uh, the community pushed against a, I think, I forget the polluted source, but I think it was like an industrial warehouse. Mm -hmm. like an industrial park that wanted to be situated next to an affordable housing project and they're like you can't do that so the the law helps them or rather the, the ej element helped them push back against that project being given a permit basically now are like our city planners you know in favor of this do they have you felt like they've been opposed or they're you know more forthcoming and working with these communities what has been what yeah. has been that that relationship between you know the city employees, you know, planning department, engineering department, and the residents. 
There's a lot of different responses. Some are that um, this is a great idea. We've been doing this already. Like we've been planning for EJ. So that's great. But I mean, there's always more that people can be doing. Um, there are some responses of, well, we don't have the funding to do, to do this well. So we don't know how we're going to get this process done. And I always push back against that because, I mean, you're supposed to update your general plan. Excuse me. Um, I think that they, that's their job. Like that's yeah. their job to like, and if you're doing a good job planning, you wouldn't need to like protect against vulnerable residents and communities, right? Like you would right. just have those things in place. Yeah. So it's like, it's their job and their duty to protect um, people's rights. Um, so they need to find the means. Um, people are supposed to do updates on a regular basis. So, you know, plans that were done in the 1970s, 80s or 90s or early 2000s really need to be updated. And some of those plans actually are that out of date. Um, some planners are against it, but usually that's because um, honestly, certain industries are really powerful, you know, like yeah. oil industry, natural gas industry, um, big agricultural industries that want to protect farms and don't care about workers' health. Um, yeah. Business interests, usually business associations are the ones most against these kinds of laws because they think that you have to either have jobs or the environment as opposed to having both. Mm -hmm. So they think of also environmental justice as being um, anti-development, yeah. which is not true. We want to have smarter development. We want to have healthy development. We want to have you know development that benefits everybody, not just the developments that protect certain people's lives and, and give certain people resources over others. No, that's true. So it varies, yeah. It varies, yeah. So as far as next steps, how can community residents participate in the process? I know that you mm -hmm. held a workshop um, that we um, helped host in March, and that was a great opportunity for residents to get involved and really hear about what SB 1000 is and to mm -hmm. also have planners and engineers and city staff and county staff there. But how can residents keep that momentum going, you know, when, mm -hmm. when their cities, you know, getting ready to uh, update their general plan. Right. The most thing that people can do, which is something that you guys are doing at Catholic Charities, is just organizing, right? Like, I think the biggest thing is coming together to keep ourselves informed and up to date with what's happening is so important. I mean, it is the city and county's job to do that, but when they're not doing the best job, we need to be our own advocates and, and and try to find those answers and tell them that they we deserve the right to have this kind of information sent to us you know like notification and accessibility is really big like are they giving us notice in ways that we can understand like are they going door to door are they having it in languages that we understand or are they having the meetings at times that we can attend like in the evenings will they have child care will they have food is it accessible to transit like all these things are important for us to be able to get involved in these planning processes um but sometimes, you know, honestly, these laws are hard. I mean, S1000 is a simple law in some ways, but it's hard to navigate these processes because there's no clear document that says, mm -hmm. here's how planning works. So I think it's all up to us to work together as, as residents, as local businesses, as community-based organizations, as advocates, as all stakeholders to like, here, let's, let's stay informed and educate ourselves, educate each other and, and know what's happening, um, as well as asking our city government to like tell us what, in which ways we can get involved. So, um, you know, Stockton, I think, went through the general plan um, update process. So they're mostly finished, but there is there are ways in which people can give feedback to the final, I think, the semifinal results. Um, you know, cities like Modesto and Ceres and others are also going through general plan update processes. So there's ways in which residents can participate in those. I think the biggest thing that we can ask for is saying, we want to make sure community engagement is done throughout the plan process from the start to implementation. We don't want to just be asked at the very end of the planning process, here's our document that we created by city government staff, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Because that's not really meaningful community engagement. So I think, you know, we deserve, you know, the right to be heard and have our voices be considered in these processes because honestly, they don't have all the information. Mm -hmm. They think they know everything, but just because mm -hmm. they have a degree or they have this background doesn't mean that they know the issues are happening on the ground in communities. So that's, I think it's like when we come together to bring all of our expertise together, we actually create more effective and powerful and balanced plans. Yeah, and I know that, and this is what I tell most of the residents that we work with is, if you don't get involved, these decisions are gonna be made with or without you. And it's mm -hmm. better for them to be, you know, be involved so that your input is considered when they're drafting these plans because it's gonna directly affect your community, 
you know, right. the fact that you don't have sidewalks or, you know what I mean? These are things that are going to affect you directly. So I always try to encourage folks to think about that, that mm -hmm. these decisions are going to be made, but it would be great if you were involved in that process. Right. So I think it's... Yeah. And the more that we document our concerns, the better. I think that one thing that's hard is that change doesn't always happen overnight, right? Like sometimes it takes a while for things to happen. Mm -hmm. And certain areas are more open to public input than others or change than others. So I think the biggest thing is not to be discouraged if mm -hmm. things don't happen overnight, but realize that even by organizing together, we're making a big difference. You know, like we're being we're becoming really powerful in exactly. that in that group, you know. And through time, when, when we get when we start to push people and push people to hear what we have to say, you're gonna see some changes over time. And I think we should celebrate all those wins. You know, exactly. the fact that we show up to meetings is a big win. The fact that we can get heard at a hearing is a win. The fact that we know what the law is a really big exactly. win. Like these are things that are honestly not set up to really include us. And the fact that we can know about these things and participate is a really big achievement. Well, thank you so much, Tiffany. I don't know, if, did you wanna add anything else? Um, I feel like we covered everything. You're so knowledgeable, so. Yeah. I think the biggest thing is trying to make this information accessible and like break it down is so important. Mm -hmm. So if there's ways in which we can all work together to make the, this, you know, these laws, these, these policies understandable and more relatable to our lives, I think that's so important. But I think that the fact that people are caring to get involved and making the time for this is great. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, we're making progress over time. Even if we don't see it, we got, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's really, we're making a difference. Well, thank you so much, Tiffany. I appreciate your time and we look forward to hearing from you. See what Great, other well, thank you so do. much. Have a good day. You too. Thank you.